Okay, so this is a, a little bit from my story in the forthcoming Rogues Anthology. It is not related to the Gentleman Bastard sequence, except spiritually. Spiritually, it's very related. Um, this is called A Year and a Day in Old Theradain, and I was not here, and I did not read this to you. <laughs> Until after the book is published, and then all is forgiven. <clears throat> And forgive me, it's uh, sitting here in word format, which means that it is going to randomly, like, change fonts on me. <laughs> the paper clip is going to come out and say, it looks like you're trying to impress a crowd, do you want it? <laughs> okay. I can help with that. Okay. There. It's that old man font. There we go. Oh, these things. All right. <clears throat> A Year and a Day in Old Theradain. Part the First, Wizard Weather. It was raining when Admiral Parathus went out just after sunset to find a drink, and there was strange magic in the rain. It came down in pale lavenders and coppers and reds, soft lines like liquid dust that turned a luminescent mist on the warm pavement. The air itself felt like champagne bubbles breaking against the skin. Over the dark shapes of distant rooftops, blue white lightning blazed and stuttering thunder chased it. Amorel would have sworn she heard screams mixed in with the thunder. The gods' damned wizards were at it again. Well, Amorel had a thirst, and an appointment, and odd rain was not even close to the worst thing that had ever fallen on her from the skies over Theradain. As she walked, Amorel dripped flickering colors that had no names. She cut a ghostly trail through fog that drifted like the murk beneath a pink and orange sea. As usual, when the wizards were particularly bad, she did not have much company. The street of pale savants was deserted. Shopkeepers stared forlornly from behind their windows on the avenue of seven angles. This had been her favorite sort of night once. Heavy weather to drive witnesses from the streets, thunder to cover the noise of feet creeping over rooftops. These days it was merely lonely, unpredictable, and dangerous. A double arc of silvery lights marked the Tanglewing Canal Bridge, the very last between her and her destination. The lights burned within lamps held by rain-stained white marble statues of shackled, hooded figures. Amorel kept her eyes fixed on her feet as she crossed the bridge. She knew the plaques beneath the statues by heart. The first two on the left, for example. Bolar Kus, traitor, now I serve Theradain always. And Kamira Tholar, murderess, now I serve Theradain always. The statues themselves were not what troubled her, nor even the lights. So what if the city lit some of its streets and its bridges with the unshriven souls of convicts bound forever into melodramatic sculptures with fatuous plaques? No, the trouble was how those unquiet spirits whispered to passers-by. Look upon me, still beating heart, and witness the price of my broken oaths. Ah, oh, fuck off, Bolar, muttered Amorel. I've heard it a dozen times before. Take warning, while your blood is still warm, and behold the eternal price of my greed and slaughter. I don't have a family to poison, Chimera. Amorel whispered the last statue on the left. It ought to be you up here, you faithless bitch. <laughs> Amorel stared at that last inscription just as she promised herself she wouldn't every time she came this way. Scavius of Shadow Street, thief. Now I serve Theradain always. I never turned my back on you, Amorel whispered, just as she promised herself she wouldn't every time she came this way. I paid for sanctuary. We all did. We begged you to get out of the game with us, but you didn't listen. You're the one who blew it. And you bent your knees to my killers before my flesh was even cold. We all bought ourselves a little piece of the city, Scavius. That was the plan. You just did it the hard way. Someday, you are going to share this vigil with me. I am done. I am done with all of that now. Light your bridge and leave me alone. There was simply no having a reasonable conversation with the dead. Amorel kept moving. She only came this way when she wanted a drink, and by the time she got off the bridge, she always needed at least two. Thunder rolled through the canyons of the streets. A building was on fire somewhere to the east, smoldering on natural purple. Flights of screeching bat-winged things filled the sky between the flames and the low, glowing clouds. Some of them tangled and fought with naked claws and barbed spears and clay jars of things that exploded. The objectives the creatures contended for were known only to gods and sorcerers. God's damned wizards and their stupid, stupid feuds. It was just too bad they ran the city. 
and it was even worse that Amorel needed their protection. Part the Second, The Furnished Belly of the Beast <clears throat> The sign of the fallen fire lay on the west side of Tanglewing Street, was, more accurately, the entire west side of Tanglewing Street. There was no room for anything else beside the cathedral of coiled bones knocked down fifteen centuries before, back when wild dragons occasionally took offense at the growing size of Theridane and paid it a visit. This one had settled so artistically in death, some long-forgotten entrepreneur had scraped out the flesh and the scales and simply roofed the steel-hard bones right where they lay. Amorel went in through the dragon's mouth and shook burnt orange rain from her hair and watched wisps of luminous steam curl up from the carpet where the droplets landed. The bouncers, lounging against eight-foot serrated fangs, all nodded to her. The tavern, door, the tavern had doors where the dragon had once had tonsils. Those doors smelled good credit and opened smoothly. The neck was for dining and the tail was for gambling. The arms offered rooms for sleeping or not sleeping as the renters preferred. Amorel's business was in the gullet, the drinking cavern under the dead beast's ribs and spine, where one hundred thousand bottles gleamed on racks and shelves behind the central bar. Goldclaw Grask, the floor manager, was an ebony-scaled goblin in a dapper suit woven from actual Bank of Theridane notes. He had one in a different denomination for every night of the week, and tonight he was wearing fifties. Amarel Parathis, he cried, the Duchess Unseen! I see you just fine! <laughs> wow, that one certainly never gets old, Grask. Hey, I'm counting glasses and silverware after you leave tonight. I am retired and loving it, said Amarel. She'd actually pulled three jobs at the sign of the fallen fire back in her working days, and certainly never for the silverware. Is uh, Safara on bar tonight? Of course, said Grask. It's the 17th. It's the same night of the month your little crew always gets together and pretends it's just an accident. Those of you that aren't lighting the streets, that is. Amarel glared. The goblin rustled over, reached up, took her left hand, and flicked his tongue contritely against her knuckles. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't mean to be an asshole. I know, you paid your tithe. You're just an honest sheep living under the bombardment like the rest of us. Look, Sofara's waving. Go have a drink on me. Sofara Miris had mismatched eyes and skin the color of rosewood, fine aquamarine hair and the hands of a street-side card sharp. When she paid her sanctuary tithe to the Parliament of Strife, she had been wanted on 312 distinct felony charges in 18 cities. These days, she was senior mage mixologist at the sign of the fallen fire, and she already had Amorel's first drink half-finished. "'Good evening, stranger,' said Sofara. She scrawled orders on a slate and handed it to one of the Libationarians, whose encyclopedic knowledge of the contents and locations of all the bottles kept the bar running. "'Do you remember when we used to be interesting people?' "'I think being alive in liberty is pretty damn interesting,' said Amorel. "'Is your wife planning on dropping in tonight?' "'Any minute now,' said Sofara, stirring equal parts liquor and illusion into a multi-layered concoction." The self-made man is holding the usual booth for us. I'm mixing you a rise and fall of empires, and Grass goes you a drink. Do you want two of these, or do you want something else? Ah, uh, do you feel like making me a peril on the sea, said Amarel? I am yours to command. Why don't you take a seat, and I'll be over when the drinks are ready. Ten dozen booths and suspended balconies filled the gullet, each carefully spaced and curtained to allow a sense of intimate privacy in the midst of grand spectacle. Lightning, visible through skylights between the dragon's ribs, crackled overhead as Amarel crossed the floor. Her people did indeed have a usual place for their usual night, and Shraplin, as usual, was holding the table. Shraplin, self-made, softly whirring concatenation of wires and gears, wore a tattered vermilion cloak embroidered with silver threads. His sculpted brass face had a black gemstone eyes and a permanent ghost of a smile. A former foundry drudge, he had taken advantage of the old Theridane law that a sentient automaton owned its own head and the thoughts therein. Over the course of fifteen years, he had carefully stolen cogs and screws and bolts and wires, and gradually replaced every inch of himself from the neck down until not a speck of his original body remained, and thus he was able to walk away from the perpetual magical indenture attached to it. Not long after that, he had found klepto-kindred spirits in Amaral Parathis' crew. You are looking wet, boss, he said. What's coming down out there? Weird water, said Amorel, taking a place beside him. It's kind of pretty, actually, and don't call me boss. Uh, certain patterns engrave themselves on my ruminatory discs, boss. Shraplin poured a touch of viscous black slime from a glass into a port on his neck. Uh, the Parliament's really going at it tonight. When I got here, purple fire was falling on the high barons. Well, that is one advantage of living in our prosperous thaumatocracy, sighed Amorel. There is always something interesting exploding nearby. Hey, here's our girls. So far, Miris had one hand under a tray of drinks and the other around Brandwin Miris's waist. 
Brandwin had frosted lavender skin that was no magical affectation, and thick amber spectacles over golden eyes. Brandwin, armorer, artificer, and physician to automatons, had the death sentence in three principalities for supplying the devices that had so frequently allowed the Duchess Unseen's crew to evade boring entanglements in local judicial systems. The only object she had ever personally stolen in her entire life was the heart of the crew's magician. Shraplin, my toy, said Brandwin. She touched fingertips to the automaton before sitting down. Valves valving and pipes piping. I am fighting fit and free of rust, said Shraplin, and your own metabolic processes and needs. They are well attended to, said Sofara with a smirk. Shall we get this meeting of the retired folks commiseration and inebriation society rolling? Here is something phlegmatic and sanguine for you, Shraplin. She handed over another tumbler of black ooze. The artificial man had no use for alcohol, so he kept a private reserve of human temperaments magically distilled into asphaltum lacquer behind the bar. A black lamps of her eyes for me, said Sofara, a tower of the elephant for the gorgeous artificer, and for you, your grace, a peril on the sea and a rise and fall of empires. Amorel hefted the ladder, a thick glass containing nine horizontal layers of rose-tinted liquors, each layer inhabited by a moving landscape. These varied from fallow hills and fields at the bottom to great cities in the middle layers to a rune-dotted waste on high, topped by clouds of foam. "'Has anyone heard from Jade?' she said. "'Same as always,' said Shraplin. "'Regards, and don't wait up.' "'Ah, oh, regards, and don't wait up,' muttered Amorel. She looked around the table, saw mismatched eyes and shaded eyes and coal black stones fixed on her in expectation. "'As always. So be it.' She raised her glass, and they did likewise." Well, here's a toast, she said. We did it and lived. We put ourselves in prison to stay out of prison. So here's to absent friends, gone where no words or treasure of ours can restore amends. To the chains we refused and the ones that snared us anyway. We did it and lived. She slammed the drink back, poured layers of foaming history down her throat. She didn't usually do this sort of thing to herself without dinner to cushion the impact, but hell, it seemed that kind of night. Lightning flashed again above the skylights. Did you have a few on your way over here, boss? said Shraplin. The Duchess is dead, said Amorel. She set her empty glass down firmly. Long live the Duchess. Now, do I have to go through the sham of pulling my cards out and dealing them, or would you all prefer to just pile your money neatly in the center of the table for me? Oh, honey, said Brandwin, we are not using your deck. It knows more tricks than a show dog. <laughs> I will handicap myself, said Amorel. She lifted her peril on the sea, admired the aquamarine waves topped with vanilla whitecaps, and two gulps added it to the ball of fast-spreading warmth in her stomach. There's some magic I can appreciate. So, are we playing cards or are we having a staring contest? The next round's on me. Part the third, cheating hands. The next round's on me, said Amorel an hour and a half later. The table was a mess of cards, banknotes, and empty glasses. The next round is in you, boss, said Shraplin. You're three ahead of the rest of us. Well, it only seems fair. What the hell did I just drink anyway? It's a little something I call the amoral instrument, said Sofara. Her eyes were shining. I am not allowed to make it for customers, and I'm kind of curious to see what happens to you, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much water off a duck's back, said Amorel, though the room did have more soft edges than she remembered, and her cards were not entirely cooperating with her plan to hold them steady. This is a mess. It's a mess. Shraplin, you are probably sober-esque. How many cards are in a standard deck? Sixty, boss. How many cards are presently visible in our hands or on the table? Seventy-eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous, said Amaral. Who is not cheating? We should be pushing ninety at this point. Who is not cheating? <laughs> I solemnly affirm that I haven't had an honest hand since we started, said Brantwin. Magician, said Sofara, tapping her cards against her breast. I'm wearing my cheating hands, boss, said Traplin. He wiggled his fingers in blurry silvery arcs. Well, this is sad. Amorel reached behind her left ear, conjured a 79th card out of her black ringlets, and added it to the pattern on the table. We really are getting old and decrepit. Fresh lightning tore the sky, painting the room in gray-white pulses. Thunder exploded just overhead. The skylights rattled in their frames, and even the great bone rafters seemed to shake. Some of the other drinkers stirred and muttered. <coughs> Ugh, fucking wizards, Amorel muttered. Present company accepted, of course. Well, why would I accept present company, said Brandwin, tangling the fingers of one hand in so far as hair, and gracefully palming an 80th card onto the table with her other. Ah, uh, this has been terrible all week, said Sofara. I think it's Ivo Vandas over in the High Barons, her and some rival I haven't managed to identify yet. They are spitting fire and rain and flying things all over the damn place. I have no idea what it's about. 
Somebody ought to stroll up there and politely ask them to give it a rest. Shraplin's gleaming head rotated slowly until he was peering at Amorel. Someone famous, maybe. Someone colorful and respected. Someone with a dangerous reputation. It is better to say nothing and be thought a fool, said Amorel, than to interfere in the business of wizards and remove all doubt. <laughs> Who needs a fresh round? The next one is still on me. I do plan on having all your money when we call it a night anyway. Part the fourth, <laughs> the trouble with glass ceilings. The thunder and lightning were continuous for the next hour. Flapping, howling things bounced off the roof at regular intervals. Half the patrons in the gullet cleared out, pursued by the cajoling of Gold Claw Grask. The sign of the fallen fire has stood for 15 <coughs> centuries, he cried. This is the safest place in all of Theridane. You really want to be out in the streets on a night like this? Have you ever considered our fine rooms in the arms? There was a high-pitched sound of shattering glass. Something large and wet and extremely dead hit the floor next to the bar, followed by a shower of skylight fragments and glowing rain. Grask squawked for a house magician to unmake the mess while the exodus quickened around him. Oh, it's so nice to be off-duty. So Farah sipped unsteadily from a tumbler of something blue and uncomplicated. The bar had cut her off from casting her own spells into drinks. <laughs> you know, said Amorel, slowly, maybe somebody really should go up there to the high barons and tell that old witchy bitch to put a leash on her pets and her stupid private war. The room, through her eyes, had grown softer and softer as the night wore on, and had now moved into a decidedly impressionistic phase. <laughs> Gold claw grass was a bright smear, chasing other bright smears across the floor, and even the cards on the table were no longer holding still long enough for Amorel to track their value. Hey, she said, so far, you're a wizard, you're a citizen in good standing, why don't we get you made a member of parliament so you can make those idiots stop? Oh, that's brilliant, said Sofara. Well, first I would need to steal or invent a really good youth binding, said the magician. Something better than the three and five I'm working now so I can ripen my practice for a century or two. You might find this timeline inconvenient for your purposes. Well, and then you'd have to find an external power locus to kick up your juice, said Bradwin. Yes, said Sofara, and harness it without any other hazard class sorcerers noticing. Oh, also, I would need to go completely out of my ever fucking head. You have got to be a dirty-souled maniac to want to spend your extended magical life trading punches with other maniacs. Once you've seized that power, there is no getting off the merry-go-round. You fight like hell just to hold on, or you get shoved off. Splat, said Brandwin, giggling. And that is not my idea of a playground, said Sofara, finishing her drink and slamming the empty glass down most emphatically. An instant later, there was a horrendous, shattering crash. A half-ton of dark-winged something, its matted fur rain-wet and reeking, plunged through the skylight directly overhead and obliterated their table. A confused blur of motion and noise attended the crash, and Amorel found herself on the floor with a dull ache between her breasts. Some dutiful, stubborn fraction of her awareness kicked its way to the surface of the alcoholic ocean that was her mind, and there clutched its straws until it had pieced together the true sequence of events. It was Shrapler, of course. The nimble automaton had shoved her aside before diving across the table to get so far and Brandwin clear. Hey, said Amorel, sitting up, you are not drunk at all. <laughs> that was part of the cheating, boss. The automaton <laughs> had been very nearly fast enough, very nearly. So far and Brandwin were safe, but his left leg was pinned under the fallen creature and the table. Oh, you best of all possible automatons, your poor foot. Brandwin crawled over to him and kissed the top of his brass head. Eh, I got three spares at home, said Shraplin. Uh, that tears it, muttered Amorel, wobbling and weaving back to her feet. Nobody drops a goddamn gargoyle on my friends. I think it's a biaki, said Brandwin, poking at the beast. It had membranous wings and a spear protruding from what might have been its neck. It smelled like old cheese washed in gangrene and graveyard dew. I think it's a Vorplax, love, said Sofara. She drunkenly assisted her wife in pulling Shraplin out from under the thing. You must consider the bilateral symmetry. I don't care what it is, said Amorel, fumbling into her long black coat. Nobody drops one on my card game or my crew. I am going to find out where this Ivo Vandas lives. I am going to give her a piece of my mind. Haste makes corpses, ba boss, said Shraplin, shaking coils and widgets from the wreckage of his foot. I was just having fun with you earlier. <sighs> oh, stupid damn commerce murdering wizards. Goldclaw Grask arrived at last with a gaggle of bartenders and waiters in train. Sofara! Are you hurt? What about the rest of you? Shraplin! Ah, that looks expensive. Tell me it's not expensive. 
I can soon be restored to prime functionality, said Traplin. But what if I suggested that tonight is an excellent night for you to tear up our bill? Uh, well, if that wouldn't get you in trouble, said the goblin, directing waiters with mops toward the growing puddle of pastel-colored rainwater and gray ichor beneath the beast. If you give it to us freely, said Sofara, it's not theft, and therefore none of us break our terms of sanctuary. And Traplin is right, Amorel, you cannot just go berate a member of the Parliament of Strife, even if you could safely cross the High Barons in the middle of this mess. Of course I can. Amorel stood up nearly straight, and after a few false starts, approximately squared her shoulders. I am not some marshmallow-muscled tourist, thank you. I am the Duchess Unseen. I stole the sound of the sunrise and the tears of a shark. I borrowed a book from the Library of Hazar and did not return it. I crossed the labyrinth of the death spiders in Maraska twice. I know, said so far. I was there. And then I went back and I stole all the death spiders. <laughs> That was ten years and an awful lot of drinking ago, said Sofara. Come on, darling, I mix most of the drinks myself. Don't scare us like this, Amarel. You are drunk and you are retired. Go home. This smelly thing could have killed us all, said Amarel. Well, thanks to a little luck and a lot of shrapnel, it didn't. Come on, Amarel. Promise us you won't do anything stupid tonight. Will you please, please promise us? Part the fifth. Removing all doubt. <laughs> the High Barons, east of Tanglewing Street, were empty of inhabitants and full of nasty surprises from the battle in progress. Amorel kept out of the open, moving from shadowed arch to garden wall to darkened doorway, stumbling frequently. The world had a fragile liquid quality, running at the edges and spinning on previously unrevealed axes. She was not drunk enough to forget that she had to take extra care, and still far too drunk to realize that she ought to be fleeing the way she'd come. The High Barons had once been a neighborhood of mansions and topiary wonders and public fountains, but the coming of the wizard Ivo Vandas had sent the former inhabitants packing. The arguments of the Parliament of Strife had blasted holes in the cobblestones and cracked and dried the fountains and sundered the mansions like unloved toy houses. The purple fire from before was still smoldering in a tall, ruined shell of wood and brick. Amorel sidestepped the street rivers of melted lead that had once been the building's roof. It was not difficult to find the manse of Ivovandus, the only lit and tended structure left in the neighborhood, guarded by smooth walls, glowing ideograms, and rustling red-green hedges, with the skeletons of many birds and small animals scattered in their undergrowth. A path of interlocked alabaster stones gleaming with internal light led forty curving yards to a golden front door. It was terribly convenient, and that guaranteed some sort of security gauntlet. The screams of terrible flying things high above made concentration even more difficult, but Amorel applied three decades of experience to the path and was not disappointed. Four trap stones she avoided by intuition, two by dumb drunken luck. The gravity orientation reversal was a trick she'd seen before. She cartwheeled sloppily over the dangerous patch, and the magic pushed her head first back to the ground rather than helplessly into the sky. She never even felt the silvery call of the tasteful hypnotic toad sculptures on the lawn, as she was too inebriated to meet their eyes and trigger the effect. <laughs> when she reached the front door, the golden surface rippled like a molten pool, and a sculpted arm emerged, clutching a knocker ring. Amorel flipped a collapsible baton out of her coat and used it to tap the ring against the door while she stood aside. There was a brief pause for the darts to hiss through empty air, and then a voice boomed. Who comes unbidden to the door of the supreme spellwright Ivo Vandus of the Honorable Parliament of Theridane? Speak, worm. I do not take shit from doors, said Amorel. <laughs> I am flattering your mistress by knocking. You tell her a lawful citizen of Theridane is here to give her a frank and unexpurgated opinion on how terrible her aim is. Your attitude is understandable and nonetheless thoroughly offensive. Arcs of electrodynamic force will now be applied to the lobes of your brain until they are scalded pulp. To receive this pronouncement in the form of universal pictogram, scream once. To request more rapid sensory oblivion, scream twice and wait to see what happens. <laughs> the name is Amorel Parathis, also known as the Duchess Unseen. Your mistress's stupid feuds are turning a fine old town into a shitsack misery farm, and they are ruining my card games. Are you going to open up, or do I find a window? Amorel Parathis, said the door. A moment passed. Your name is not unknown. You purchased sanctuary from the Parliament of Theridane two years and four months ago. Anador, said Amorel. <laughs> the mistress will receive you. The sculpted hand holding the knocker withdrew into the liquid surface of the door. A dozen others burst forth, grabbing Amorel by the throat, arms, legs, coat, and hair. They pulled her off her feet and into the rippling golden surface, which solidified an instant later and retained no trace of her passage. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So that, that is uh, 2% of the world's longest short story. No, uh, <laughs> that is uh, uh, five parts out of 14. It's still a very long short story, but uh, it'll be available in Rogues sometime in 2014. Um, and to get it, you have to put up with the scribblings of 37 other writers. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but uh, George would not let it happen any other way.